her iron rod, and slavery clang her galling chain. We'll fear them not, we trust in God, New England's God forever reigns. This week's episode begins with one of the most popular anthems of the American Revolution, Chester, a song whose lyrics cite the twin evils of tyranny and slavery as New England's chief justification for war. As it happened, the tyranny of British rule would prove the more immediate of these evils, leaving the second, slavery, to be confronted in a separate conflict, the story of which will eventually round out our three-part series on the Age of Revolution. Meanwhile, our reading of Born in Battle continues with part two of the very long day of April 19, 1775. Thus far, we've covered the events surrounding a nocturnal British search-and-destroy mission from Leachmere Point in Charlestown to Lexington Green, where a vanguard of light infantry exchanged fire with a small force of American militiamen in the pre-dawn twilight. The war for American independence had begun, and we pick up now as the regulars resume their fateful march to Concord. It was nearly five o'clock in the morning when Colonel Smith marched into Lexington with the Grenadiers and the rest of the light infantry, and rode over to confer with Major Pitcairn of the Royal Marines. What was done was done. Certainly the secrecy Gage had intended in Smith's marching orders was a moot point. Smith's column gave a cheer and fired the traditional victory volley, and the regulars stepped out for Concord again, now to the shrill of the fifes and the rattle of drums. Dr. Prescott had already carried into Concord in the dark the news that the British were on the march, but in the first light of day Reuben Brown, a Concord saddler, rode in from Lexington to tell all he knew. There had been a fight with the regulars on Lexington Green, and he believed men had been shot. At the same time, word of the skirmish at Lexington was coursing through the countryside with the special velocity of bad news. In Concord, the bell had already turned out its militia on the common, and these were soon joined by a company from nearby Lincoln. As the sun rose, militiamen from a half-dozen other towns, in companies, squads, and individually, were converging on Concord as well. Colonel James Barrett of the Concord Militia took command. Women and children were to hustle into hiding whatever remained of the military stores. One detachment of militiamen would take up defensive positions on high ground above the road into town. The other, a hundred men or so, marching band and all, would proceed a mile out on the Lexington Road and wait for the redcoats. As Smith led his column up that road, he should have had a good sense of the terrain ahead, for de Bernier had sketched the town in some detail two months earlier. At Miriam's corner just ahead, one road broke off southward to Lincoln, and another northward to Bedford. Beyond the corner at Wright's Tavern, the Lexington Road turned due north into Concord. A long ridge, fifty feet high to the east, overlooked both the road and the town square to the west. At the far end of the square, Main Street turned due west to the south bridge over the Sudbury River, a tributary of the Concord. The Lexington Road continued for another mile to the north bridge over the Concord River itself. Beyond the bridge was Punkatasset Hill, two hundred feet high. At its base a country lane ran west to Colonel Barrett's farm. As the British vanguard approached, Smith could see that the ridge to his right was occupied in some force, and the road ahead was held by Barrett's slim battalion. Under the circumstances, the British commander once again divided his column. Pitcairn took the light infantry up the side of the ridge to the open plain on top, while Smith, with the grenadiers, marched on toward the militia in the road. Perhaps Lexington had taught the Yankees a sharp lesson for as Pitcairn's men went up the ridge, the Americans pulled back, 
went down the other side and withdrew toward the river. Meanwhile, Barrett's militiamen wheeled smartly in the road and marched back toward the town, as if incongruously leading the redcoats in a parade toward Concord. We marched before the redcoats, a Concord Minuteman remembered, with our drums and fifes a goin, and when their band took up the tune, we had grand music. Indeed, it looked for a time that music was all they would have in Concord this morning, for neither body of militiamen stopped until they had crossed North Bridge and climbed Punkatasset Hill. Opposite Wright's Tavern, the British column halted and at last set to work toward achieving their original purpose, the destruction of American war materiel in Concord. Smith sent six companies of light infantry under Captain Lawrence Parsons forward to hold the North Bridge and seize whatever could be seized at Barrett's farm on the far side of the river. Meanwhile, the grenadiers would search the town. This they did with a good measure of restraint, though as a political gesture they did chop down the town's liberty pole. Squads went house to house, searching barns and outbuildings as well, but no villager was harmed. Hungry and thirsty redcoats even paid for food and drink. What the British had to show for their efforts, though, was not considerable. Three small cannon, several gun carriages, some flour, tools, and odds and ends of harness. What was burnable of their seizure went into a pile near the courthouse and was set afire. Meanwhile, Parsons reached the North Bridge by eight o'clock, left three companies there, and guided by de Bernier, hiked on himself with the other three to search Barrett's farm. Of the three companies left behind, two went part way up the slope of Punkatasset Hill to form a picket line against the Americans on its crest, while the third was posted at the bridge. The day was warming pleasantly, and it must have seemed light duty after the regulars' long night of marching in the cold. On top of Punkatasset Hill, however, was a gathering storm of Americans. In addition to the Concord and Lincoln men, companies and parts of companies from Acton, Bedford, Littleton, and Westford were tramping in, building their number to four or five hundred. But like Captain Parker before them, they weren't quite sure what was to be done now that they were here. While the regulars rested below, a council of war was taking place above or more accurately, a kind of town meeting with muskets was in session. Officers and men of the various commands were debating a motion to attack the British, an issue complicated by a spirited discussion about who ought to lead such an attack. Then someone saw smoke rising from the town. It rose from the fire the grenadiers had set to destroy the captured stores, and the blaze had spread apparently by accident, to the courthouse nearby. In fact, the grenadiers were even now passing buckets and saving Concord's courthouse from the flames. But from the crest of Punkatasset Hill it seemed certain that the regulars were burning the town, and that was more than enough to move the question and resolve the debate. Down the hill the Americans came in two loosely organized columns, and as they neared the two companies of regulars that had advanced westward from the north bridge, they began to fan out in a long line on the grassy slope. Major John Buttrick of the Concord Company, appointed by Colonel Barrett, was nominally in command, but this line was simply a wave of citizen soldiers united in purpose by the black smoke rising above Concord. At this point, the two British light infantry companies under the crest looked up, saw what they guessed to be a thousand armed men in motion toward them, and without lengthy debate of their own, scrambled down the slope to join the third at the bridge. The senior officer there, Captain Walter Lorry, with just a hundred muskets on hand, sent straight away to Smith for reinforcement from the grenadiers. The militiamen now crossed a stone wall halted to dress their ragged line, then pushed on to the road leading to the bridge. 
Lorry ordered his three companies to withdraw across the bridge, but with the Americans so close, well within musket shot, he put his command in an awkward spot. With three companies lined up one behind the other on the road, only the frontmost company could bring fire to bear on the advancing Americans. Apparently what Lorry had in mind at this point was one of the light infantry evolutions newly introduced in the British Army, a street-fighting formation, four ranks of eight men each. The front rank was to fire a volley and retire to the rear to reload. The second rank, in turn, was to step up, fire, and retire, and so on. The idea was that a company so formed could keep up a continuous fire on a narrow front. But Lorry would never get a chance to test the new tactic properly. With the militiamen just fifty yards off, the regulars closest to the point of collision let loose a sputter of odd shots, then flamed out with a volley. Most of their fire whistled over the Americans' heads, but it was enough to kill two and wound a third. Some were actually astonished to discover that the regulars were firing live ammunition in a real shooting war. God damn it, one howled. They're firing ball. Quickly recovering, however, the militiamen now let loose a volley of their own, and three redcoats fell dead or dying, and nine more wounded. Then something even more astonishing happened. British regulars, disciplined troops whose conquests stretched from the banks of the Mississippi River to remote Bengal, began to break and run. Some, it seems, were trying to follow the street-fighting tactic Lorry intended, firing and withdrawing to the rear. But with four of their eight officers down with wounds, the rearward movement became a retreat and the retreat soon became a rout that did not stop until the redcoats had run a full mile back to town. The Americans, meanwhile, swarmed over the bridge and down the road, a wild, heady, motley mob with no particular idea of what to do next. One of these excited Americans came upon one of the fallen redcoats on the bridge, and when the wounded man gave a groan and tried to sit up, the startled young American struck him a blow in the head with a hatchet and hurried on. The battle by the rude bridge that arched the flood had lasted five minutes, all told. While muskets flared across North Bridge, in nearby Concord, Smith, in response to Lorry's urgent request, had decided to send a detachment of grenadiers to his aid. As Lieutenant John Barker later confided to his diary, the colonel ordered two or three companies, but put himself at their head, by which means he stopped them from being on time. For being a very heavy, fat man, he would not have reached the bridge in half an hour, though it was not half a mile to it. The detachment was in time, however, to run into the wash of Lorry's disordered retreat and advance toward the Americans who were themselves utterly disordered. At the sight of the advancing, bare-hatted grenadiers, the Americans halted, considered, then withdrew in two bodies, one back across the bridge to the slope of Punkatasset, and the other to the high ground east of the road. While the militiamen were surging over the north bridge and back again, Parsons' three companies of light infantry were still searching Barrett's farm, and understandably alarmed by the rattle of musketry off to their east. Having discovered nothing of value at Barrett's, they stepped out and reached the bridge about eleven o'clock. Under the muzzles of hundreds of American muskets, three companies of His Majesty's troops, not a hundred in all, were there for the taking. But confusion in the American camp enabled the redcoats to slip across the river unmolested and start for Concord. The sight of three comrades, crumpled like so many scarlet bundles near the bridge, however, inspired both horror and speed. One appeared to have had the top of his head cut off, and by the time the grim report reached the town, rumor had it that the soldier had been scalped, his head much mangled, and his ears cut off, though not quite dead. Unknowingly, 
the country youth who struck the clumsy hatchet blow, himself no doubt much terrified, had helped spread panic before him. It was noon before Smith loaded his wounded into horse-drawn chairs, a kind of light carriage, and concentrated his whole command for the march to Boston, twenty-two miles away. Smith sent the light infantry up that long, low ridge parallel to the Lexington Road to cover what was now the left flank of the British line of march, while the grenadiers, the wounded among them, started down the road in column. At Miriam's corner, the light infantrymen climbed down once more to file in behind the grenadiers, and the whole column began to jam up, waiting for the chairs bearing the wounded to cross the narrow bridge ahead. Here the long agony for the British began in earnest. For the Americans, both those who had fought at the bridge, and hundreds more, were posted in the woods on both flanks and in the road directly in their rear. Odd shots were already whistling into the redcoats as the column got moving again and over the bridge. As the last of the light infantry crossed, it faced about and fired a volley down the road, tumbling several Americans. The Americans responded not with a volley exactly, but with a heavy, sustained ripping of musketry from the road and woods. Several redcoats were hit and staggered on. Two fell in the road, and that was as close as they would ever get to Boston. From stone walls and trees, houses and outbuildings, now came what one regular remembered as a veritable furnace of musketry. The Americans were not well organized, but no matter. There were a lot of them, all converging on this road since Revere and Dawes first roused the sleeping countryside the night before. Even Parker and some of the Lexington men were here for another crack at the Redcoats. Ensign de Bernier, the erstwhile spy, reckoned there could not be less than five thousand of them. They fired, slipped away, rammed home another cartridge, then stepped up and fired again, taking every advantage of the cover, while a column of seven hundred men passed unprotected along the road. Not only was the fire increasingly destructive, it was maddening to regulars drilled to make a stand-up fight in line of battle. These Americans seemed to Lieutenant Sutherland mere concealed villains who made cowardly disposition to murder us all. And if not murder exactly, it was murderous enough. At the same time, the Americans gave the Redcoats few targets to turn on in their own defense. Musket balls flew from every point of the compass, but the British saw little more than running forms and powder smoke. Smith did what he could under the circumstances, and sent out platoons of flankers to drive the enemy off. When these detachments were able to drive numbers of Americans against the regulars on the road, they were brutally effective, and the tawny April woods were splashed with blood. It was one thing, the militia learned to their grief, to shoot a redcoat from ambush, quite another to confront him at the point of a bayonet. For the most part, though, redcoats banged away to little effect, were shot while they tried to reload or press on, and filled the narrow road with their dead and wounded. It was not really a march any longer, or even a retreat, but an advance to the rear under a galling fire. Thus Smith's column staggered toward Lexington. The only good fortune Smith, limping himself with a nasty leg wound, could count at this point was that the Americans, though many and fiercely determined, were under no particular direction. It was in essence the old militia turned out, every man his own general, every company its own army. Had the militiamen managed to get across Smith's line of march in any strength, and halt the head of the column, twenty-one companies of His Majesty's elite might well have been annihilated or captured in a body. As one British officer later admitted, we were so fatigued that we could not keep flankering parties out, so that we must soon have laid down our arms or been picked off by the rebels at their pleasure. As it was, by two o'clock the red-coat column beset flanks and rear and low on ammunition, 
was in danger of coming completely unraveled. In the neighborhood of Fisk's Hill, still nearly a mile from Lexington, the head of the column did in fact break into a wild rush down the road. Pitcairn, trying to ride ahead to stem the rout, lost his mount and a fine pair of pistols in the tumult of running redcoats and American musketry. A handful of officers, though, did achieve what the Americans never did on April 19th. They got across the path of desperate men and halted them at the point of their own fusils, shortened versions of the regulation musket. Thus chastened, the regulars reformed, and the column went stumbling, sweating, and bleeding on toward the scene of the morning's fleeting success. Such salvation as the redcoats would see this side of Boston was in fact awaiting them, Lord Percy and the 1st Brigade. As Smith's column reached Lexington about 2.30, they could see on a grassy knoll beyond the meeting-house 800 muskets drawn up in a sturdy square. On each side of the road stood a six-pound cannon at the ready. Dazed, cheering, desperate, grateful men passed through the ranks of the 1st Brigade and fell in exhausted heaps near Monroe's tavern. One witness remembered them panting in the heat, their tongues hanging out of their mouths like those of dogs after a chase. Percy's rather tardy arrival here was just another piece of the general lack of expedition in the whole enterprise. General Gage back in Boston had made his mind up to send the 1st Brigade to Smith's support as early as 3 o'clock last night, and orders went out directly to the Brigade Major to muster its four regiments on the common at 4 and march at once for Concord. These orders fell through the cracks of the command system, however, and when, at five, a rider on a lathered horse arrived from Smith asking for the first, the orders to muster and march went out again. By six o'clock, the 4th, 23rd, and 47th regiments were at last on the common in marching kit, waiting patiently for the arrival of the 1st Marine Battalion, and they would continue to wait, since no one remembered that the orders to muster the Marines had gone to its commander, and that officer... John Pitcairn had been on the road all night long with the light infantry. It was nearly nine o'clock before Percy got matters sorted out and the 1st Brigade, minus its flank companies already with Smith, started across Boston Neck to his support. The fact that the planks of the great bridge at Cambridge had been pulled up might have alerted Lord Percy to trouble ahead, but it wasn't until nearly two that a wounded man from Smith reached him with news of the running battle ahead. Percy had been wise to bring the two six-pounders of the Royal Artillery along. As Smith's played-out men came in through his ranks, Americans behind them swarmed across Lexington Green and up the road. Two rounds from each gun, however, scattered them in short order. At this point, Percy may have regretted not bringing the wagon carrying the extra ammunition. The Americans were certainly keeping up a respectful distance from the guns, at least for the moment, but the British had just twenty-two rounds left now. Fifteen miles of road lay ahead, and Percy guessed ten thousand Americans behind. In an hour another ten thousand could well be at hand. If the militiamen brought guns of their own up as well, Percy would simply have joined Smith in disaster and disgrace. While Percy's square and the two six-pounders held the fort, the regulars rested and attended to their wounded as best they could. Percy conferred briefly with Smith and Pitcairn, but the most junior subaltern could make this command decision. It was either march for Boston or capitulate here on the green where the trouble had started. At 3.30, Smith's men formed up in column again to take the lead. The relatively fresh four regiments of the 1st Brigade fell in behind. From the relief force, Percy sent out flankers to clear as best he could the line of march. The 23rd, the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, took up the unenviable position of rear guard, though each regiment would have its turn there before the day was done.
Not far from Lexington, the pop and sputter of musket fire picked up again as the redcoats trudged with their wounded down the gauntlet that was now the road to monotony. Again from New England's ubiquitous stone walls, from patches of wood, from empty houses, the militiamen kept up the running battle. If anything, the fighting turned more savage as the day wore on. Squads of redcoats rushed into houses along the way and, maddened by their own misery, did not discriminate too nicely between combatants and non-combatants. These Americans, after all, fought like Indians and were not above scalping a hapless soldier. Certainly some Americans who took no part in the fighting died with those who did. And if there was a fire in the hearth, the house generally went up in flames often plundered as it burned. Later, atrocity tales from both parties had their origins in actual events along this road. Meanwhile, Percy managed his forces effectively and drove the Americans off as best he could. Men fell and had to be left, but he kept his column moving steadily toward Boston. On the American side, such control of the battle as would be exerted, or at least attempted, came from Dr. Warren and General William Heath of the Massachusetts Militia, both of whom hurried on to Monotomy late in the afternoon along with companies from Roxbury, Brookline, Dorchester, and Danvers. There, near the foot of the rocks, the militiamen made their most determined effort to halt the red coat column and crush what was virtually half of Gage's North American command. But Percy, whose leadership throughout was cool-headed and effective, sent detachments out to press both flanks of the militia and brought up his six-pounders. For a time the fighting blew up fiercely and at close quarters. In places the redcoats went in with the bayonet and were met by militiamen with clubbed muskets. One musket ball knocked a pin neatly out of Warren's hair without wounding him. But the guns weighed in heavily enough to drive the Americans back and clear the road once more. The redcoats, now down to the last of their ammunition, pressed on through monotony toward Boston and safety. Percy, however, had one more critical command decision to make and this would actually present the Americans with one more opportunity to strike a crushing blow. In the shadow of Prospect Hill, ahead, the road forked. One leg broke off south to Cambridge, Roxbury, and Boston Neck. The other ran eastward to Charlestown Neck and the peninsula town beyond. Though Percy could only guess what lay ahead, Americans were in fact in motion to deny the Redcoats passage along both of these routes. After the militia lines were broken at Monotomy, Heath withdrew his command and hiked on to Great Bridge in Cambridge. It is hard to know just how many men Heath had with him, but a thousand in any event, and in all likelihood enough to keep Percy's column from crossing the Charles River while it was overwhelmed from the rear. From the north, 700 militiamen from Salem and Essex under Major Timothy Pickering were crossing the Mystic River and marching down the Medford Road to dispute the British passage along the neck into Charlestown. In the end, though, nothing came of either effort for the Americans. At Prospect Hill, Percy was forced to swing his six-pounders into action again to clear the road, but he ordered the column to press on directly and wisely for Charlestown Neck. Thus, in Cambridge, Heath's men waited anxiously at Great Bridge for redcoats who never came, and by the time Pickering's command finally reached the junction of the Monotomy and Medford roads outside Charlestown, the British had already passed, though not by much, and were trudging across the neck. In the gathering dusk behind them, muskets continued to flash, but the regulars now were under the protecting guns of the British Navy. At length the firing sputtered out in the dark. And still the battle was not quite done for the road-worn and battle-weary redcoats. Crossing the neck, they pushed on past Mill Pond on their right 
shouldered aside crowds of refugees fleeing Charlestown and climbed Bunker Hill on their left. There they rested on their arms and waited for reinforcements, this time from the second and third brigades now rowing toward the Charlestown shore with cannon and trenching tools and ammunition. When these arrived, they threw up a sturdy redoubt on the hill supported by field guns. Soon after, the light infantry and grenadiers staggered down to the empty boats and crossed the Charles to their barracks in Boston. It was after midnight, twenty-four hours and fifty miles, since they had waded ashore through the black muck at Leechmere Point. They had been under fire nearly continuously since Miriam's corner outside Concord. But their ordeal on what Americans now remember as Battle Road was over. It remained for other minds, British and American, to weigh the meaning and the consequences of the violence of April 19, 1775. Gage's immediate reckoning had to be troubling. As Amos Barrett, one of the conquered men, never forgot, a great many lay dead and the road was bloody. Of the 1,500 men who set out with Smith or marched with Percy, Gage counted 73 dead, 174 wounded, and 26 missing. That made for 273 casualties, nearly one in five, on this raid to disarm the Americans. And such a battle! A confused, running fight on a front 16 miles long and never more than 200 yards deep. A blind, baffling struggle against a multitude who swarmed everywhere but who would nowhere close for a decisive stand-up encounter. And yet there was no denying that the Americans fought trained regulars effectively and with a determined will. The day's events certainly made Lord Percy revise his earlier assessment of the American militia. As he wrote home to London soon after, whoever looks upon them as an irregular mob will be much mistaken. They have men amongst them who know very well what they are about, having been employed as rangers against the Indians. Nor are several of them void of a spirit of enthusiasm, for many of them advanced within ten yards to fire at me and other officers, though they were mortally certain of being put to death themselves in an instant. At least one casualty of Concord and Lexington was the complacent conviction that two regiments of regulars would overwhelm the whole force of the provincial militia. Lieutenant John Barker, himself lucky to come away from the affair unhurt, concluded that this expedition from beginning to end was as ill-planned and ill-executed as it was possible to be. And in truth much had gone awry for the British. Gage had intended both secrecy and speed, but two days before the light infantry and grenadiers even got their marching orders, the militia throughout the province were already preparing to receive them. Then, too, fat, sluggish Francis Smith was hardly the best choice to lead a flying column, and the three hours he wasted simply getting a fair start for Concord were three hours the militia spent on the march. The military stores destroyed that morning were trifling, and the expedition had ended ill enough at dusk. But for Percy's timely arrival at Lexington and capable handling of the column home, it might have been worse yet. As for the Americans, they had, on the face of it, won a lopsided victory in the first battle of the war that neither party had quite intended to begin that day. Though there was no telling how many militiamen actually fired a musket, four or five thousand is a good guess, they numbered their own losses carefully at day's end. Forty-nine dead, thirty-nine wounded, and five missing. Still less than a hundred in a ten-hour fight against fifteen hundred of His Majesty's regulars. Further, these losses came from more than two dozen communities, an encouraging indication of just how vigilant and responsive the militia companies were. By sunset of the following day, some 10,000 armed Americans gathered in the immediate vicinity of Boston. 
and yet in all this show of force was much to trouble the colonial leadership. Put bluntly, there had not been much leadership. Captain Parker and Colonel Barrett, for example, had turned their companies out in good order, but once assembled, neither was sure what he was to do next. Poor Parker had stood there in the dark, wondering whether his duty called him to stand or disband in the face of the enemy. It had taken a more or less accidental collision on Lexington Green, and then a wrong-headed conclusion about that fire in Concord to push Americans into battle. The resolution of the Provincial Congress last October advised the militias to act solely on the defensive, relying on the principles of reason and self-preservation to guide them. Cautious and careful advice, high-minded even, but not very useful as rules of engagement. And once the battle had been joined at Concord, it more or less fought itself. Britons who imagined the provincial militias to be mobs without spirit or discipline turned out to be half right. Spirit enough there had been, as the regulars were now willing to admit. But many a redcoat was still alive that night because the Americans had shown such little discipline on the firing line all along Battle Road. What military men today call command and control had little part in the American effort. Companies and squads and individuals marched into the fight and out of it again, part of a battle with no battle plan or field commander. Dr. Warren, President of the Provincial Congress and Chairman of the Committee of Safety, in theory at any rate, headed the entire provincial militia, but he ended up in the thick of the fight at Monotomy like any private soldier. The Massachusetts militia, for all its armed men, was still largely a paper organization. One of the great strengths of colonial society was its vigorous, participatory democracy. This society, by long habit, trusted in the town meeting, the church congregation, the popular assembly. It valued discussion, debate, consensus building in the solution to complex problems. It had a decent respect for its elite, but it resisted top-down governance. In effect, Colonel Barrett was presiding over, not commanding, the militiamen on the crest of Punkatasset Hill. Their rush down the slope to attack was spurred by a spontaneous impulse to protect their homes from a palpable and immediate danger. The attack had succeeded, and the militiamen had enjoyed a great day, no doubt. They had closed with the regulars in combat, had even seen the king's best break before them in undisguised panic. But today's encounter, for all its ferocity, had been more running skirmish through the woods than pitched battle. It remained to be seen whether the Americans, committed to democratic principles and processes, could make an army out of these citizen soldiers and sustain a war against a great empire and its vast resources. For the moment, though, the British lion was at bay, licking its considerable wounds and hemmed in by an arc of American campfires running from Chelsea to Dorchester. Exhausted though they were, the militiamen were no doubt uplifted, perhaps even a little astonished by the day's triumph. And still, some few might have shared a dark thought this night with a comrade in their cause, John Adams, the other Adams Massachusetts sent to the Continental Congress. He had been for some years an insistent and articulate voice in the defense of American liberty. But when word of Lexington and Concord reached him, he did not, like his cousin, rejoice that the cause of liberty had come to a test of arms. When I reflect and consider, he wrote, that the fight was between those whose parents but a few generations ago were brothers, I shudder at the thought, and there's no knowing where our calamities will end. 